what you're breathing now is going to stay with you for the rest of your life. You are what you breathe? Yes. You're breathing your future? Yes. So what you're breathing is very relevant. Think about it. You drink two liters of water a day, you eat one kilogram of food a day, and you breathe 25 kilos of air. How important is that? Now, take a deep breath. Now, feel the air within you to the center of your body, where the outside world comes into you and goes to whisper from your bloodstream, bringing all of the outside into your organs, into your whole organism. Now, breathe again with me. What if you don't like what you breathe? Can you just close your nose and stop doing it? No, you're going to die. So you're in good company, because 95% of the global population is exposed to unsafe air. Seven million people are dying because of air pollution, dying. And a lot of people are sick, very sick because of air pollution. So we are facing the worst health crisis in human race. This thing is killing us silently. So when I became a mother, and af slightly after that, I lost two of my family members because of air pollution, my emotional... Uh, state was veering between uh, anxiety, fear, and anger. To say in other words, I was really pissed off. Now, this can't happen. I mean, you can't die because of what you breathe. So I had to do something about it. I'm a very stubborn girl, and so I decided I would study. What was the problem? And this is what I discovered. Basically, what we know is that um, Living by a tree does not protect you by, from air pollution, okay? So, oh, I have a garden outside, I'm, not, I'm immune to air pollution. Not right. Second myth, if I don't stay there long enough, exposed to air pollution, I'm not going to be affected. Wrong. Your DNA in two hours is going to change the way it behaves. Two hours. Third, air pollution goes in the most amazing places you would never believe. Besides your brain, the fetus, it can affect, and this you're not going to like, even your sexual health. Hmm. Why is this happening? Because 92% of the particles are too small to respond to gravity or ventilation. Therefore, they remain suspended in the air, simply going where electrostatic fields drive them. If, if we eat badly or we drink too much, we feel sick. Now, what happens if we are breathing dirty air? How do we know? Well, we know because of our neurons. Now, air pollution affects your neural uh, activity just as drugs would. When there's peaks of violence in cities are related to peaks of pollution, this means that even criminality is linked to air pollution. Your own marriage could be linked to air pollution if you don't move to the countryside. Mind you. So let's go back to breathing. Let's take another deep breath. Ah, so you do this 30,000 times a day. All this air that comes in, if it's polluted, is going to affect your body. Your liver, your lungs are fighting the pollution. Therefore, you're not strong enough to fight viruses to fight diseases, to fight cancer. Well, we are like toxic sponges, you know, full of pollution. So this is impossible to escape. So pollution is very democratic. It affects everybody in the same way. We can't raise walls and stop them at immigration and say, hey, you know what? I won't want your air in my country. You can't. It's going to go around. If you think about it, DDT sprayed for malaria in Africa was found in the fat of the polar bears in Antarctica. No way of stopping it. But it was never like this. Until 400 years ago, everything was in balance. That's very simple, just to oversimplify everything. The, the cycle of oxygen is very easy. We emit CO2, the good CO2. The uh, plants capture it and use it at, for food with photosynthesis, and then it becomes oxygen that goes back to us, a circle. Fantastic. All in perfect balance. Until 
430 years ago. What happened? We had progress. So we started uh, burning fossil fuels, producing things, chemistry came into the picture. And chemistry took with it a lot of toxins, a lot of side effects, which killed us. So bad CO2 and all the emissions that are killing us right now. If we curb emissions, if we curb the toxins that are killing us, we are going to affect climate change as well. They're both very linked. Pollution is accumulating all over the world, and we can't stop the world from turning. So this is utopistic. And but even if, let's say, all the leaders in the world decided to stop emitting all at once, which will never happen, we know very well. What's going to happen? Uh, 50 years at least, it's going to take very optimistically to get the Earth rid of all of the toxins from the soil, from the air, from the waters. A long time. What's going to happen to the people in the meantime? We're all going to die? So the solution to this problem is within my DNA. And I'm going to tell you why. I grew up with a scientist. And I don't know if some of you did, but it is a unique experience, really. So my uncle is a brilliant scientist from the United States that worked 30 years discovering and studying biotech. Now, um, growing with him, the stories, I mean, other kids listen to stories like Cinderella, like the Magic Flute. Well, my version of Cinderella was that the bacteria are going to save the world instead of the mice, and the, the Magic Flute was chemistry, you know, playing like music. Wow, so <laughs> when I got older and, you know, the Cinderella wears off, uh, he came up with something more, drive more momentum, and that was the silent apocalypse. Now, everybody was playing in Hollywood movies like with tsunamis and, you know, earthquakes and the end of the world, terrible. And he came up with this peculiar concept. Now, picture this. The oxygen around the earth, the air we breathe, doesn't come from the outer space. It's there. It's a limited supply. It's produced by nature. The oxygen within that air is 20.95%. Now, guess what? Humans, to live, need 19.5% oxygen in the air. What if the oxygen goes down? We're all going to die, like, silently. So I looked at my uncle and said, man, you have a problem, you know? This obsession with the end of the world, uh, the climate change, and everything has to stop. You know, you have to get cured from some good drink. And I was a kid, I couldn't get it. But now that I think about it, what are the drivers that brought us, can bring us there? One, deforestation. We're there. Two, the oceans. Polluting the oceans with plastic, microplastic, will definitely destroy the oxygen supply. Third, emitting. We are emitting like crazy. Spending as, you know, with, with a credit card without limits. Fourth, overpopulation. We are definitely a lot of people here. Come on, you know? I'm not saying this is going to be possible, but hey, give it a thought. Now, there could be a planet B, but it doesn't have our faces in there. Because some animals and some species, my uncle thought, could survive this. Let's see something more uplifting now. Let's talk about solutions. Now, if you think about it, when the Earth started, there was the waters that were toxic. Then came the bacteria, and the bacteria cleaned the water. So fish could develop, reptiles could develop, mammals could develop, and then the man came on Earth. And there, we studied the same bacteria, thinking, can they do this again, all over again? Can we use them? Well, the good news is yes. So we discovered a way to put them in a box. And within this box, they grow, and they create a field of clean air around them that actually attracts and digests pollution into good CO2, water, and elemental bases, which are minerals, 
Well, great. So we could clean, we could create clean air bubbles around people to, you know, create safe environments. And in the same time, at the same time, you know, governments can curb uh, pollution and they can plant trees and we can respect the oceans and everything is going to be cool. Great. You know, we knew we had a problem. Now we know how to fix it. Fantastic. Planet B can wait. We spent eight years of validation to take this to the public. And we had a scale-up plan, so the plan included, okay, we're going to create pure air zones where you can find the logo on the door. We're going to place them in a map with an app where everybody can find pure air. Bang, like this, like Wi-Fi, like clean water. Hey, at the end of the day, this is not impossible, is it? So we went to the people, we went to the companies, we went to the policymakers and said, hey, we have this beautiful plan. We're going to save everybody while you are curbing emissions, while you are making the world a better place. And they were in total denial. They just said, what? We don't have a problem with air. I mean, we visited factories with people covered in dust, saying, <coughs> we don't have any problem here. I don't see the problem. So this is like being an alcoholic, you know? If you don't know and acknowledge that you have a problem, you won't be able to fix it. So that was the first thing. You have a problem, man. So we were ready to give up. We were done, you know? All of these studies, nobody believes us, forget it. You know, our families were angry at us, a bank was very angry at us, our team was looking at me and saying, listen, enough, you know, where are we going here? But there's a partial good end of the story here. Thanks to philanthropists and how the world is moving now, thanks to very important and fantastic people that are trying to change the world in a better world. Now there are incubators, accelerators, new terms for clean tech, deep tech, whatever impact VCs that will invest money into technologies that will change the world and make it a better place. And there we were, we went to London, we met people that did the same thing we did. Wow, so beautiful technologies that will be more profitable than the technology that made the world this terrible place we're living in. So fantastic, there is a way out. But is it gonna happen on time? We are the generation that has the opportunity to change this. Now, responsibility is a term that's used in a very negative way. You are responsible of this and you have to fix it. Well, think about responsibility in another, under another light. Response ability, ability to respond. We do. We have the technology. We have the people. We can all unite and change the world. But it's up to you. This is what you have to do. Now, in, uh, in, we went to companies to present this technology lately, and we found new positions of executives like head of purpose, head of uh, work well-being, that was so cool. You know, these are the allies we have into large companies that are changing the world, that have a purpose, a long-term vision for their companies. So those are the people that are making changes because the big companies understood that people don't buy the products you make, but why? Why are you doing this? What I'm saying is you can change how you tune into your life every day. So you can tune in um, fear and anxiety and anger, as I was, and make miserable everybody around you and turn into more fear and anger. Or you can have an active changing mode, you know? Go out there and inspire people and find a long-term goal and change this world. Now this is going to change. You have a life with purpose which makes your life exponentially better. I'll leave you with this. It's three steps to change the world. One, find a cause you like. Go for it. Two, surround yourself with people you trust. People that will join you into what you believe. Three, be consistent with your choices. Just choose the right products, spend the money in the right things, Work for the companies you like. Be an example for your children. This is very important, crucial. 
And uh, more, moreover, dive in and dream big. Bold, big dreams and dreamers are an asset today, a very big asset. Because only who is crazy enough to think that they can change the world are the ones that do. So thank you. Thank <laughs> you.